So, as I said, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> uh, this talk is on the laws of nature, but the reason to begin with this moralism is to highlight two things. Uh, the first and most important is the distinction this command illustrates between descriptive and prescriptive law. I hope more than anything that you will take uh, this distinction home with you. I mean to show you, or at least uh, sermonize from this pulpit, that descriptive law is the aim and the achievement of empirical science. Prescriptive law, by contrast, is religious and moral. This is the other thing that that command illustrates. The laws of nature, as they've been understood in the modern age, are more religious than empirical. This has large consequences for this conference and the intellectual movement behind it. So for goodness sake, pay heed to the preacher. <laughs> On the one hand, there are the laws that describe how we actually behave, our practice. On the other, there are the laws of how things ought to be, like the laws of Moses. But I claim these also include the laws of mathematical physics. And this is where all of us here will have a stake. I learned the distinction from philology, where I was taught the difference between a lexicon and a dictionary. A lexicon follows usage. In the case of a dead language, it contains all attestations of words that occur in a finite literary corpus. A dictionary, <clears throat> on the other hand, tells you how to speak. It is a repository of correct language. This distinction may be confusing, especially in the case of the Oxford English Dictionary, which is gradually turning from a dictionary into a lexicon. This is in line with the political and liberal empirical temperament of the scholars who now produce it. Rather than codifying good English, it more and more reflects simply the way that we use words. Lexicons express descriptive law, dictionaries prescriptive or normative law. Now, I remember when this word first entered the OED with some fanfare due mostly to the iconic usage of Homer Simpson. It was a thing to celebrate the cultural arrival of a truly original cartoon. But think about do from the perspective of my children consulting the OED. It's just a word, a correct word. This is the innocent way that descriptive law becomes prescriptive law. This generation's descriptions become the next generation's prescriptions. The reception of Wikipedia has a similar trajectory. Those of us who saw it come into being, especially if we had some familiarity with the subject of a particular article, could find it a useful and even stimulating thing. But for my children, it's the law. It's the coolest thing ever, said my youngest. As much as anything else, the consensus-driven unscience that it codifies helps to lock out from young minds the new paradigms <clears throat> that this conference promotes. Now, these are not drawings, excuse me, but chemical impressions made on paper by Michael Faraday of iron filings in the presence of electric currents and, and magnets. You can see some of them, the, the currents are coming perpendicular to the page, and you see the right-hand rule and so on. Hence the, uh, well, I think instantly, at first sight, one intuits the concept of a field. Some of us also might intuit instinctively how a vector calculus might describe and even measure this field. The field seems to be the real thing going on here, <clears throat> which problematizes to this day the way one interprets the, quote, power sources, that is to say, the electric currents and magnets. Faraday supplied his observations and the laws that he had induced from them to James Clerk Maxwell, who drew on a number of descriptive laws, including those discovered by André Ampère and uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss. The correspondence between Faraday and Maxwell, and also much earlier the letters between Faraday and Ampère, are a treasure for those interested in the life of the mind. Faraday is a hero of mine, uh, not so much because of his inabilities at mathematics, but because of his deep-seated skepticism about what the mathematics contributed to the understanding gained from experiment. Maxwell is also a hero in that he exemplifies the natural philosopher of days gone by. One of my favorite things is a, uh, of his is a paper called Are There Real Analogies in Nature, which I encourage you to Google. Are there real analogies in nature? But he's a hero to the world in large part because his name attaches um, to these equations. These are translations uh, into the language of the calculus of descriptive laws. 
Hence, they also are descriptive laws themselves. You see, for example, that the net magnetic flux, or V, there in line two, uh, is zero. This is a way of saying that there are no magnetic monopoles. That investiga investigators continue to seek these monopoles healthily underscores the descriptive nature of these laws. But the plot thickens. One buys into things with this language and this description that perhaps should be described as the fine print or the Apple software agreement. To begin with, <laughs> these equations of the field seem to ignore the power sources, as I said, the magnets and currents. All the efficacy of these things is measured in the tensions of the surrounding space. The most religious acolytes of the field consider these power sources to be illusory. Feel the field, young Luke, not the force. These people, I presume, can also pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. One also adopts of necessity the world view of the calculus. Continuity is assumed in the premises of such an analysis and then projected into the empirical reality. I don't actually quarrel with this. Even those among us who feel that space is quantized cannot but imagine if they're human that a quantum of any size can be, uh, can be divided. The infinitesimal is the inadible unit of the calculus. Do you see the little so-called coefficients, uh, literally partners in motive causality, m sub zero and e sub zero? Uh, these things are concessions to reality. Anyone who has rolled balls down an inclined plane will recognize friction as an analogous concession. Real things rub, and the rub is we don't know what rubbing means. Galileo's laws turn out to be close enough for science, which is a lot further off than the close precision required of jazz. As the legend says, these coefficients in the Maxwell equations are conventionally called permeability and permittivity, with reference to the operations of magnetism and electricity, respectively. If you can explain the difference, you must be closer to the heart of jazz than me. Fudge factor is uh, an evocative phrase. What these equations set up quite innocently, but also definitely, is a mindset where the laws of a pure and ideal realm need corrective factors, coefficients, that are a concession to the realities of measured observation. It is as though there is a pure law that has to be adapted to a dirty world. I believe this mindset, as I'm calling it, has practical consequences for the teaching of physics that take it beyond the empirical to the inculcation of a dualist worldview. One of the most powerful notions generated by this dualism is the idea of a vacuum. Here the empirical hypotheses become laws of nature. These laws would all be perfect in a vacuum, but they need coefficients to apply to our world. I wonder if we will agree with me that this laws in a vacuum mindset innocently conceived sets up a typically religious dualism in the teaching expressed as follows. But there is much more to say. To understand the power of mathematics in underpinning the laws of nature, as this term gained currency in the Enlightenment or physical laws, as we now style them, one might as well go to the most direct source of modern thinking on natural law. Here is what St. Thomas Aquinas had to say. I think I'll just leave that up there for you. Although uh, Thomas is not known for his thinking on mathematics, I would call attention here to his use of, uh, rules and uh, uses of rule and measure and the wonderful distinction between the thing measuring and the thing measured. This distinction, I think, is quite lost in Albert Einstein, as in Protagoras of ages past, who said, man is the measure of all things. Now, Enlightenment thinkers latched on to the phrase, inverted from natural law to laws of nature, but also in some measure the thought, as did the American founders, Martin Luther King, and some members of the current American Supreme Court. But the Enlightenment revolutionaries had a project which remains active to this day, at least in America. Socrates used to break down the assumptions of his prominent interlocutors, statesmen, businessmen, scientists, in the marketplace where everyone passed by, in front of his captivated youthful followers. But he did not supply these young proto-nihilists with a substitute by way of dogma. Socrates knew that he did not know and he was offensively smug about this. There is a chilling point in his apology, written up by Plato, which is not often noticed, his claim after the verdict that the city did not know that he had been restraining this youth and that they would now be unleashed when he was dead. 
A remarkable number of the figures who appear in Plato's dialogues about the lost era of his youth, the, the flower of Athenian culture and empire, were well known to have ended up in the aftermath as members of the 30 tyrants, or worse. It is tempting to see a danger here in the Socratic method where beliefs and assumptions are broken down, but nothing is left in its place, apart from a sort of animal self-interest. The Enlightenment generation thought ahead about this. They knew that if the first estate, the nobility, and the second estate, uh, the church, were to be displaced and eviscerated, something needed to take their place, or the post-revolutionary society of the third estate, the commons, would be all anarchy and terrorism. A key component of the new hierarchy, all but filling the perceived need for religious awe, but also some part of the new nobility, think, for example, of winners of the Nobel Prize, was the newly emergent mathematical physics whose acme was Newton's Principia, along with its leading savants. In more recent times, we have had the cults of Einstein and Hawking and the celebrity of Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. I would highlight the conscious way in which modern societies have adopted new stars and leading lights. As these very terms suggest, they fill these societies' needs for an astral religion. Nicholas Copernicus' astronomy, Francis Bacon's Novum Organon, the invasion of the Americas, all these things clearly transformed the pre-revolutionary Western consciousness. Bacon, in particular, is a fascinating case. He was the champion of empirical science and descriptive law before he had all that much discovery to champion. But these laws were not to be used merely for the reading of the book of nature. They were to be used for the control of her. The sense of authority and power that came with the project of inducing nature's laws played no small role, I would argue, in filling a void left by a displaced nobility and a church divorced from the state. Of course, this precy is fearfully oversimplified, but that does not mean it is distorted. Mathematics abstracts into a vacuum sometimes in order to see certain things more clearly. Across fields of research, there was a self-consciousness about the public role of science. The rhetoric of Charles Darwin, for example, it's consciously evocative of biblical prose. I had a Christian biologist colleague who demonstrated this. Darwin knew what he was intending to replace and how, therefore, to speak of nature capitalized in religious tones. Although the empirical and descriptive spirit of Bacon lived on, there came to be an infusion of what we might call top-down thinking. Consider the development of modern chemistry. Antoine Lavoisier, who was guillotined, subscribed to the teaching of one Abbé de Condillac, whom he quotes thus, we think only through the medium of words. Languages are true analytical methods. Algebra, which is adapted to its purpose in every species of expression, in the most simple, most exact, and best manner possible, is at the same time a language and an analytical method. The art of reasoning is nothing more than a language well arranged. He adds in his own voice, as Lavoisier, thus while I thought myself employed only in forming a nomenclature and while I proposed to myself nothing more than to improve the chemical language, my work transformed itself by degrees without my being able to prevent it into a treatise upon the elements of chemistry. Now, the word element actually means letter. Roman schoolchildren apparently began the second column of their written exercises with the graphemes L, M, N, whence L, M, N, tum. Uh, nowhere more than in chemistry was the metaphor of the book of nature more formative of theory. Lavoisier's rational nomenclature turned out to be erroneous, however. His acid generator, oxygen, turns out to be hydrogen, the water generator, uh, to speak of you know, their Greek meanings, and perhaps vice versa. But we live with these terms as proper names now, hydrogen and oxygen, separated from their Greek origin and also Lavoisier's intention. Why do you reckon there were 24 elements in his original table? Because there are 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. <laughs> the giveaway is that the first revision of the table produced 48 elements, a whole number multiple. This is classical top-down chemistry in more senses than one. But even the Russian Dmitry Mendeleev, who produced what we know as the periodic table in the wake of the discovery of Pythagorean octaves, in the ways that chemicals interacted with each other as they rose in atomic weight, was animated by the idea of the language of nature. The periodic table added to Lavoisier's nomenclature what you might call the syntax of this language. 
When Mendeleev predicted certain undiscovered elements to complete the apparent periods in nature, he assigned them Sanskrit numbers as prefixes. This was in honor of an admired friend and colleague of his, a Sanskritist who had published an edition of Panini, the ancient Sanskrit grammarian who is sometimes called the Euclid of grammar. Chemistry offered the grammar of the book of nature, the one true book, the new Bible. There is actually a passage from Mendeleev's seminal, seminal article. Note in the second uh, paragraph, the provisional status of descriptive law. I, I don't know if I'm going to read it out, but it's really good. Um, but it's stuff you know. And, and, and the standards by which competing inductive hypotheses can be compared. The electric universe lives and succeeds by these standards. But apart from this you know, principal statement of Baconian empiricism, I cannot resist the political implication of this new circumscription of the noble metals. That's in the first paragraph. A post, uh, as he says, precisely for the motive expressed above that the so-called noble metals occupy the place which has been given them in the system. Post-revolutionary science heralded a new political as well as religious order, not an abandonment of either politics or religion. Proponents of plasma cosmology, I feel, need to be aware of the rootedness of this fact in the present age. Okay, my claim so far is quite simple, really a sermon or slogan. Descriptive law and its corrective empirical methodology constitute true science. Prescriptive law, expressed as the laws of nature or physical laws, which form the bedrock of what is commonly thought to be science, is in its nature religious. Science is religion. I would claim that mathematics, and in particular the assumptions of the calculus, lent the laws of physics an unquestioned and mystical status, apart from their empirical truthfulness, due to a religious void and a political need. Upon the rock of mathematics, they have built their church and state. But again, the plot thickens. The fact is that mathematics is mysterious, especially to our modern uh, relativist sensibilities. Whatever string theorists may advertise about the ability to write their own rules, mathematics from early ages to this one has contained kingdoms of necessary truth. Think in particular about arithmetic. It is not up to you whether a combination of two equivalent quanta is double each separate quantum. And one has to express oneself this way because if you say one plus one equals two, there's always someone who says, well, that's just Arabic notation or that's just in base 10. In one way, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, in such confusion and its origins, but what I'm talking about, however, is not a matter of symbols or notation, but the underlying reality that makes all such expressions possible. The Pythagoreans discovered whole numbers in nature. The octave scale is encompassed by the ratio 2 to 1 and is compounded of the ratios 3 to 2, the fifth, and 4 to 3, which is the fourth. These are the musical intervals. Such discoveries made it more than tempting to think that nature answered to our mathematics and that the discoveries of our minds would at once be discoveries of the nature of things. To know something is to know its measure. Hence the supposed crisis for them in the discovery of incommensurability in geometry. Well, that's another lecture. The octave expresses two things that are spoken of so much less musically in modern science. Quantization, which is, I think, an awful word, and periodicity. These are the holy grails of the empirical induction of laws of nature. Halton Arp showed that redshifts in orthogonally connected galaxy quasar series are quantized. We speak, we have spoken, of solar cycles. Parenthetically, a word of caution. It is brave, shall we say, to suggest that the Maunder minimum is a cyclic event. It was not an ice age. For all we know, it happened once. In, in, in uh, induction, one swallow does not make a spring. I suspect a dangerous intrusion of prescriptive law into the realm of descriptive law right here. Cycles gain a certain autonomy in the mind. The solar cycle begs the question about a cycle in the planetary or galactic circuit. Is it local or general? We need periodicity because otherwise we often have no law. It would be good to ask when faced with an ostensibly empirical claim, how would it make me feel if there were no cycle really? When we feel the threat of this possibility, we can appreciate that perhaps we need a cycle in nature more than truth does and more than it needs us. 
Who of us has the intellectual courage to say that they really don't know whether the sun will rise tomorrow? Do necessary truths extend beyond the realm of arithmetic? Of course, there is the law of non-contradiction, which I believe was formulated ultimately because Greek philosophers were trying to analyze how geometers proved things. But what about necessary truth in geometry itself? Euclid's Elements subsumes the world of arithmetic within its middle books. That's um, book seven to nine. His book one out of 13 begins with a set of definitions, common notions, and postulates. Common notions include truths fundamental to arithmetic, such as equals added to equals are equal. Euclid does not feel he has to prove them. They are necessary truths. <clears throat> but postulates are literally demands, which must be accepted by his audience before his demonstrations may proceed. The last two postulates read like propositions. It is to Euclid's credit that he felt that you could never prove them. The fifth is famously, is, is famous. It's pragmatically, it accomplishes the same end as Playfair's axiom that at most one straight line can be drawn through a point not on a given straight line, parallel to the given line. It defines what is nowadays called Euclidean space. Most would deny that this is a necessary truth since two geometries have since been developed that use the two other logical options. There's more than one parallel line or none at all. The latter, the Riemannian, allows for the possibility of a universe in that all straight lines eventually meet, and there therefore remains the possibility of a whole and a single turn or universe of the fixed stars. Euclid and Lobachevsky, and indeed parallel lines, instead require not a universe but an infinitude. Such things never meet, uh, like woman and man, although they may get closer and closer. <laughs> I would argue, however, that the fourth postulate is a necessary truth, not because it can be proven, but because alternatives are unthinkable. All right angles are equal. Uh, for Euclid, this postulate makes it possible to measure things rationally, and also to be sure that measurements over here will correspond to measurements over there. It is the first and primal standard of equality in Euclid. A ruler cannot be built without it. All the geometries require it. So I feel that you may walk away from this talk with an absolute truth in your pocket. It is known that Abraham Lincoln was devoted to Euclid. I believe he finally perceived the high words of Thomas Jefferson through a Euclidean prism, which allowed him to discern an equality in the abstract that looked perhaps absurd to the senses. This is an extraordinary political power resident in the necessary truth of mathematics. It allowed him to see human beings, uh, males at any rate, in the same way that Euclid saw right angles. There's a last chapter I wish to tell however, about the development of mathematical physics in the last century and a half, which does not alter my theme that the truth of mathematics is mysterious, but that mathematical physics is rather mysticism. The constant here, interpreted to be the velocity of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum, is derived straightforwardly from second derivatives of Maxwell's equations, which look like wave equations. The second expression is perfectly fine, but it masks what the first expression says. Uh, the second part of it there. Um, there they, uh, do you remember our friends permittivity and permeability? <laughs> there they are, the little devils. They turn out to be the key to this constant velocity of light. I do not understand why professionals speak of the constant speed of light in a vacuum when this constancy is expressible in terms of decidedly non-vacuous coefficient stuff. Perhaps someone here um, could explain this to me. Uh, Bob Johnson gave a fascinating talk two years ago uh, about the Michelson-Morley experiment, which did not meet the predictions expected of an ether for the transmission of light waves, but most certainly did not give a zero result, as is popularly suggested. He interpret interpreted the result as a function of these uh, coefficients, which must be there in any plasma environment, necessarily, <laughs> not a necessary truth. Our universe or infinitude is virtually all parts plasma and non-vacuum, so far as we can tell. Vacuums are thinkable, but not necessarily existent, like infinite divisibility in measurement theory. All the same, I believe that this derivation of C, the constant velocity of light from Maxwell's equations, has caused a rebirth of Pythagoreanism that endures to this day and likely for the foreseeable future. 
This is because an unexpected fact emerged from what were descriptive equations without any empirical prompt, but with decided empirical consequences. Hence, this constant C has opened itself to the testing requirements of natural law outlined by Mendeleev and others in the tradition started by Bacon. Uh, I'm obliged to leave it to others to decide whether it has passed the test or whether instead uh, Maxwell's equations need to be tweaked or otherwise revisited. Now, what is most important is that the descriptive equations produced a fact with physical consequences. This is the essential Pythagorean transaction between the reciprocal illumination of our mathematics and the nature of nature. And for Albert Einstein, here I wager <clears throat> more from a sense for his temperament uh, than a direct statement of his, that it was the possibility of such a derivation that turned Maxwell's equations into physical law or laws of nature. Note uh, Einstein's use of postulate. He belonged to perhaps the last generation who knew how to cite Euclid by book and proposition number. We have apparently learned better how to teach geometry in schools, clever post-war people that we are. But these two postulates violate the law of non-contradiction. Really, it is the second postulate by itself that is self-contradictory. It is impossible that there be an absolute velocity. The first simply says that the laws of nature are invariant for every inertial system. Uh, this constant C has the terms of velocity, distance over time. Unlike acceleration, it is an inherently relative thing. If one moves toward or away from something approaching with a constant velocity, say a train or a bus, its apparent velocity has to be different as surely as one plus one has to equal two. Einstein is also sophisticated in his use of theory in this paragraph and in this paper, this epochal paper. His usage recalls Aristotle's theoria, a state of contemplation beyond deductive science. Some would call this concept mystical, but one person's mysterious is another mysticism. In this case, the theory embraces a contradiction. One imagines a conversation where Einstein's first wife exclaimed over breakfast coffee, Albert, why can't they both be true? The sum total of the thought process is called the special theory, not postulate or principle of relativity. For undisclosed reasons, he insisted on sharing the Nobel Prize with her. When Einstein says that the second postulate is only apparently irreconcilable um, with the first, I suggest that all he means is that equations of transformation of measurement between different inertial systems, which have been anticipated by uh, Conrad Lorentz, could be written under the constraints of the constant velocity of light. And he proceeds to derive them in the paper. For what it's worth, the Lorentz transformation should work for any value of c, say 10 miles an hour. It is the size of the velocity in question and the consequence that most of our experience remains essentially unaffected that sugarcoats the paradox of its absolute constancy. This by no means amounts to a resolution of the contradiction. In Euclid, such a reductio ad absurdum would refute the premise, in this case, the constancy of the velocity of light as a law of nature. It does not pass the sniff test of philosophy. Uh, that's a little joke for Duardo. But the postulate is not only close enough for science, it has come to define exactitude in empirical law. The rationale is therefore pragmatic at best. It draws up practical consequences in the form of equations that could be tested, although Einstein, true Pythagorean that he was, disdained such empirical testing. Hence, we must alter the expression I used earlier about laws in a vacuum, what is and what ought to be. When it comes to the two postulates of special relativity, I quote the poet. Now, the laws of plasma physics are all descriptive. I suspect that none of the wondrous phenomena that some of you have learned about at this conference for the first time could have been predicted. Rather, the scotting man was a thing seen, whether by ancient humans or in a plasma lab. Plasma phenomena are observed, described, and analyzed mathematically after the fact. Then they could be compared, in this case, serendipitously for Dave Talbot and Anthony Peratt. Their meeting recalls the interaction between Faraday and Maxwell. We engage in a descriptive science par excellence, which, while Thornhill has shown to the world, produces verifiable predictions. The truth of mathematics in itself and as it reflects the world is in fact mysterious, but the mathematical physics of both Newtonians and Einstein is rather mysticism. This is not to say it is untrue, but like the Catholic theory of the Trinity, it cannot be said how it is true. 
instantaneous action at a distance in gravity and the constancy of the speed of light, Maxwell and Einstein, embrace violations of the law of non-contradiction and ignore the empirical reality of plasma and its characteristic behavior pervading the as yet observable world. If gravity and relativity are truly to be shown to be descriptive theory, that is science, it remains a task for the electric universe to show how. I have faith that this can be done. Heaven floats on a sea of neutrinos. When there are things and forces bumping around and apparently unemployed, it is standard to say that electricity do doesn't do anything in the cosmos. It is time for a new theory, whether in politics or in natural philosophy, when you have these unemployed things. In this way, a cognitive world of dark forces may be illuminated, let there be light. This is a coda. A number of well-meaning friends of the electric universe, by which I do not mean naive friends, are exploring ways in which education and physics can be reformed in such a way that students may become receptive to alternate paradigms, rather than be indoctrinated in a single one. Thereafter, the revolution takes care of itself. For my part, or the physics takes care of itself is what I mean. For my part, I think that students need to learn only how to demonstrate propositions from Euclid and to learn how to read Homer in Greek. Thereafter, physics will follow, take care of itself. <laughs> uh, there is a broader scope to this problem, however, and I really mean it, just a page. The term jihad has been stoked by activist imams and adopted by anarchistic and terroristic groups around the world. It is documented that all these groups began in grievances of a highly concrete nature, for all that they have gone on to take a deadly nihilistic life of their own. There were American troops in the holy lands of the Arabian desert. There have been successive foreign occupations of Afghanistan, the bloody evisceration of Iraq. Above all, there is the generations-long situation in Palestine. What the robbed and aggrieved want is revenge, but they are Muslim and belonging to the tradition of Judaism and Christianity that has, shall we say, a moral problem with revenge. That, I suggest, is the ter reason this term jihad has been exploited. Christendom is an old hand at this game. We have produced abominations to Christianity like the Christian soldier or the holy war. But at the root of things is the unjust loss of property or status, not at all an actual threat to religious belief. To exact revenge, a devotee of these faiths generally needs to see themselves as an agent of God, a justicer. In the civic realm, we find ourselves able to distinguish an executioner from a murderer, and so does he or she who performs this duty. I shall say I do not understand the distinction. The scientific academy is a place of property, exclusivity, and high status, which depends in many ways on top-down and mathematized theories that it cannot prove. It is, in other words, a theocracy. So what the electric universe movement needs to be prepared for as it threatens established property, exclusivity, status, and religious belief is jihad from the other side. <laughs> Swear words like fringe, pseudo, and crackpot are just the opening salvo in a war of word control that does not end with mere ostracism. Giordano Bruno and Halton Arp may be chatting with Socrates this very minute. He would tell them that there is no Socrates left to restrain either the academic establishment or its jihadists. Opening minds through education is obviously a good thing, but here is my advice. Prepare for a fight. Thank you.